Making a life worth living and retirement worth having is really about providing people the opportunities that they need in life. It can be really difficult for people who are homeless. Have you ever really thought about what it's like to be homeless? You see, when you don't ever think about how far you are away from homelessness, you never really consider the actual consequences of what can happen if you lose your employment or if you lose your job or if you really just lose someone important in life. You never really know how that loss of a loved one is going to impact your soul. You never really know how it's going to impact your willingness to perform in any position, whether it's working for someone else or whether it is literally performing for your own company. In my life, I've lost some important people, so I sort of know how that feels. But I'm encouraging you, each person listening, each person watching, to really think for just a moment. Look around you. Look at your life. Look at your bank accounts. Look at your bankers. Look at how you spend your money. Look at your materialism. How easy would it be for you to move out in a weekend? I literally understand what that's like. But do you know what it's like to have to move out of your home in one weekend? What if you're a renter? What if you're a home buyer? What if something literally happens to your significant other, your spouse, your life partner, and they are a part of that breadwinning team in your family? Are you prepared to take on the mortgage payment, the rent payment, and all the bills all alone? This is what we're talking about in homelessness. We're really talking about understanding what homelessness is. There are many programs in theory to help the homeless, but there really aren't as many as we think. There are not enough shelters, that's for sure. They are not well designed, that's absolutely true. They literally put people together who are sort of well and sort of not well. That is good and it's also bad. Openly, they usually are a mass bunkhouse, like the military, but that's not necessarily healthy for the individual who's trying to survive on his own later after he's been in one of these facilities. He starts to get accustomed to people around him. In the movie Shawshank Redemption, we saw how that was for one elderly man. He had literally been the librarian in that prison for many, many, many years, and he was finally released. He went out into the world, and he was completely alone. They treated him like an old fart, they, and I forgive the expression, but that's what it was like for him. He was sort of talked down to by young people. He was difficult in terms of realizing he didn't have to ask permission in life to do things because he was not treated as a full-fledged man of giving his honor to decide when he got up and when he ate and when he did things. But we're sort of doing that a little bit in shelters. There literally are lights-out situations and things, and that's good for people who really never learned those things of children. But for those people who are going into homelessness because of a loss, because of a divorce, because of cyber hacking that happens today, because of how technology can be used to manipulate a person's opportunities in life, how other companies can actually go after their competitors and ruin their opportunities by stealing their clients and doing all sorts of things that is maliciousness that we don't want to believe happens in this world but really does, is something we really have to think about. You see, in our life, we have to really know what it is that makes a difference in our life. You see, it's our paycheck that puts food on the table and a roof over our house and our heads, and openly, that's important, of course. We are all trained from little children, we hope, that that's a responsibility. Now, I don't ever remember a lesson in any of my classes talking about that. I literally don't ever remember a class or a teacher saying, now, when you're older, you're going to be responsible for these things. I literally just remember being hit by college and realizing that it was then time to get a job and thankfully I was good looking enough and articulated enough to make the interest of some people after I returned from going abroad. And that put me into a position. My intelligence, my willingness to read, my willingness to develop libraries for organizations, my willingness to write on behalf of executives did that for me. But literally, let's look at your life. What would literally happen if you lost your job tomorrow? How many days, how many weeks, how many months, how many years could you survive based off what you have in savings? Now, before I sound like a financial planner, I'm talking about real life, folks. I'm also talking about what happens with our property. You see, when we lose our documentation because someone thieves it from our home, we don't have all the materials we need to go and produce for ourselves a new place to live. 
when we don't get our mail on time because we're not honoring the U.S. Postal System that's been around since the Pony Express, that literally we might be losing a really valuable resource to get information about what's happening in our lives. When we are forced to have mechanics that are not good, that literally barely pass the mechanics exam and literally don't have any official degrees or training, doesn't necessarily mean that they don't know how to fix a car. It just means we're not sure where the liability lays. And when we have vehicles that really should be put to pasture, we need to know what tests are going to provide us that actual factual information. There needs to be new laws on mechanics that literally says, if this car truly cannot run safely and get good gas mileage as it is, then maybe it's time to tell the owner it's time to part ways with it. But then there are these services that want to take your vehicle for a couple hundred dollars when the vehicle has a much greater value than that and they're not sharing in the wealth. We have to know how to take care of those things. We have to know who to call to get the best deals. We have to know where we can go to not get our cars ruined by mechanics that really don't have the skill sets or the knowledge or the certification in the newest and latest technologies going on with vehicles. You see, the loss of a vehicle, the lack of a vehicle, can really put people in poverty. Because one of the things that recruiters often ask about is, do you have reliable transportation? Why? Because of this old mentality that everybody's got to be perfectly on time to something. That we're learning in our other corporations that have flex time is not actually true. There are literally ways for companies to change scheduling for people who are going through problems. There are literally ways for HR directors to get that their employees are representing a large corporation and that they need to make sure that every employee gets that message that there's a liability for that. I told a story a few days ago about a situation with Kroger that I was appalled with. I literally called the corporate office and do you know what literally happened? Absolutely nothing. I never got a call from anyone from that organization apologizing other than some lady in the flower department who apologized to me for what I had experienced. She had been an educator for 30 some years. She understood how important it was and I encouraged her to put herself up for as a training coordinator. Now I'm getting a little off topic, but let's get back to your life. Look at your life. How easy would it be for you to go on in life if you were under some sort of legal or litigal, litigational influence that is not under your control? Divorce often does that to us. We're put in a situation we never thought we'd be in when we went down the altar. We openly are faced with dividing up assets, figuring out who's going to look after the kids. We're going to have to worry about what latchkey children turn out like for their own lives, how they're going to make the right relationships when our family has become dysfunctional. And that's really true. But what I'm really talking about is homelessness. You see, all these factors in life, every single piece of it, impacts whether or not a person gets a home, our credit in particular. Who came about with this credit stuff? Credit is certainly important in the world, but we have to have points of forgiveness. We've got credit agencies that go after our lives looking for money, but if we didn't actually do the situation that put us in the credit problem, there has to be an out. There has to be a legal clause that says we can prove it. But that means we have to be able to get someone on the phone with the people who are sending us a bill. And that is a difficult point. Now we're talking really about full aspects of living, of responsibilities of adulthood, and what literally happens when we lose our opportunities in life. Now this is openly just to talk about homelessness. It's not about anything else really. It's about what happens to people. How do they become homeless? What does it feel like? It feels horrible. If you've never really thought about it, then you're not really looking at your life well enough. You're not planning your life, probably, because you're probably thinking, I'll be in this job a long time. I'm not going anywhere. That's your opinion. But what if you get a supervisor in place who doesn't like you? What if you get a manager who wants to clean house? What if you get downsized? What if you literally lose that income? What's your backup plan? You see, we have to have relationships with people in positions of power and people who know how to help us get things done. There are people in our lives, our families included, that will sit in the sidelines when we're homeless. 
We have business contacts that we've done a lot for, that we've talked to, that we've given encouragement to, that will literally say, sorry, can't help you. So you're not really thinking about the importance of what homelessness is for someone else. You've got to start thinking about what is homelessness for me? If I'm so well connected in my church community, who would help me in this church community if I'm homeless? Does the church really have a good program? A lot of these homeless programs do a lot of violation of rights. They violate our rights to have a private shower. They violate our rights in terms of giving our legal information to volunteers, which we would have never given that information to in our lives. They put our things in cabinetry that have no locks, and there are no locks on any building in America that really are uh, thief-proof. So openly, we're putting our hands at risk. We're also putting our people at risk when we produce and gather food because we have to watch the dates. We have to make sure that things aren't being tainted in by people who have ill will. How do we protect the food of the world is a really important question going forward. But more importantly, how are we protecting our cars from bad gasoline being brought into the nation because it's not being well tested on a regular enough basis by local authorities? You see, there's so many different factors that can play into a person's homelessness that people see and then they don't see. There's a lot of invisibles. There's a lot of invisibles of our lives. Things we take literally for granted. What would you do if you lost your car? What would you do if it was stolen? What would you do if it was in an accident? That's easy. Insurance covers. But it takes a long time to replace that vehicle. And most of the time, we don't get the full value back. You see, we've got a lot of things that go on in our life that can create homelessness, that can put us behind or in the rears in making payments, especially if we're not making that three times the month rent or mortgage payment that we need to be making to keep ourselves under shelter, weathering the storm. I want you to think for a moment, what is it like to be homeless? If you have no home and if you have no car, what do you do when it's raining? How many shop owners will open their door and say, please come inside, get out from the storm? How many restaurants will say, oh my God, you're homeless here, please have a meal on us? It would be our honor to feed you today. We can't maybe do it every day, but we'll try. There's lots of food that gets thrown away. So if people can throw food away on their plates, then gosh, maybe we could produce a meal a day for one person. You see, we have to start looking at the solutions. We have to start looking at portions on our plates. We have to start paying attention. Does everyone eat all of this food? And if not, then we need to shift the portions and shift the prices. But openly, I'm talking about homelessness. I'm saying, how do we protect ourselves from becoming homeless because we think it's somebody else who's homeless? I certainly believe that. I saw a statistical report on people who had a particular condition of which I understand, and I realized, how is that even remotely possible? And here I am facing it myself. But as a reporter, I must go on. I must continue to observe. I must continue my journalistic efforts. I must continue to tell stories. And I literally am trying to get people to buy into this idea that homelessness is really something that impacts me as much as it impacts you. And when I say me, I don't mean me personally because I'm handling it the best that I can with literally no help other than a few God-fearing agencies that have actually helped me. They didn't put me through a process like they did with normal people. They got it pretty clearly that that wasn't going to work in my situation. And they simply said, on that matter, we can help you right now. You see, helping people out of homelessness is letting them tell you what their challenges are and you finding someone in an organization, in a church, in a large group that says, I know someone that can help on that without a cost to you. And it's also about helping people to get jobs. Jobs are the number one thing that's talked about across the land. We always hear about the unemployment rates in different cities. We always hear about unemployment rates in different states. They're always lobbied up in terms of who and what is number one and who is the worst. And in our educational system, we do the same sort of little thing. But are we training children not to become homeless? Are we producing children in their gifts and talents so that they soar all the time and people see them so soaring that they want to give them their money. They want to invest their time with them. They want to provide them resources for their own lives to stay out of homelessness. 
You see, homelessness really should be a campaign of the nation. Feeding the homeless is important, but our programs need to start to interconnect. They literally need to start interconnecting in a way that makes others understand what one group is doing and what is needed by the fact that another group is not doing it. You see, in life, we have moments of time to help people. You can see a beggar on the street and you can say, we have two options here. I can give you money for food, I can take you to have a meal and we can talk about your life, or I literally can try and help you to find a job. You have to figure out whether or not the person is serious about getting out of homelessness. I was walking down the streets of Indianapolis and I'd never seen a beggar on the street before in Indianapolis. Our city is really lovely about that. It's not like Cincinnati and other places that I visited in the past where you literally can't walk anywhere without someone saying, hey man, you got some money for me. That happened to me once in Greenwood and I just was like, you know, was not tolerant, honestly. I just had a rough day and I just couldn't handle someone trying to bum a cigarette from a guy like me who doesn't smoke. But it's not about that. It's about the fact that I felt I missed an opportunity to tell him that God loved him and he could put his life on track if he started to pray. A lot of people think my life's not on track. That is true. But have I lost my faith? Not completely. I've certainly come close based on how people treat me. But I'm talking about homelessness. I'm not talking about me all the time. I'm literally saying, if it's you, what will you do? What is your emergency plan? My late father used to have a book in the laundry room of my mother's area that she pretty much was the dominating engineer within. And it really was of what to do if mom and dad died. I'm not sure that was the title, but it's pretty catchy, don't you think? The reality is it was that if something happened to mom and dad when we were young, what were we supposed to do? Who would we call? Where would we go? Where would we find the insurance policy information? And all the things that he had planned for just in case he passed early. It was a scary thing to think about as a child, but it was such a blessing now looking at it now in adulthood. When I see how people live in adulthood and in retirement and in senior homes or with other family members. You see, when we grow old, there's only a handful of places that we can live, literally. We're no longer of employment age, usually. We've timed out or our energy levels won't allow it. But there certainly are plenty of people working later and later in life. Why? Because they've not planned how to avoid homelessness. So you see, homelessness is really a mantra that we all need to start focusing on from the earliest of ages. To let people have compassion for the homeless is important. To help people to understand what's required to avoid homelessness is essential. To help children understand why education is so literally important is literally to take them around homeless people and have them hear some of the life stories of what went wrong. Where did that turn in the road occur? These are the stories that a documentarian can capture that can be played in a classroom on a weekly basis. As a part of morning announcements might even be the best time. Some of these little announcements of when we're doing stuff and what's happening, that's lovely. But what about life impacting change? What about creating a community of love? What about creating opportunities for people to show their love to homeless people is not the point, but to help them understand the realities of homelessness, what it comes from is truly is mistakes in life, is not getting enough education, is not taking responsibility, is not building relationships, or is losing relationships, or losing hope. Now this has been Blake Genson talking in real time, talking live perhaps, talking authentically, talking transparently, transparently about homelessness. You see, homelessness is not something downtown Indianapolis. Homelessness is literally a couple paychecks away for most people. And only when everyone, even moms who don't have to work, get that, that if their husbands pass, what will they literally do to put food on the table? If they stay so out of the professional realm, how are they gonna provide for their children? If people are so unwilling to hear about new technologies, new opportunities, new ways to make a living, new ways to create side income, how will you ever retire? On my life, I can tell you that I never imagined to be homeless. And I'm not seeking your empathy. I'm just saying I'm trying to talk to you about homelessness in a way that makes sense to your soul. 
that if you're not willing to look at this, if you turn me off immediately, then you just might end up homeless at some point. And maybe you haven't produced a life worth living enough for retirement, but maybe you've not produced the relationships that you need, not through social media to, tools, through live interactions with people, by joining organizations, by getting involved, by being resources for people. In life, we have moments in time to make a difference for others. We have moments in time to say, you know, that guy knows how to talk, or that guy knows how to write, or that gal knows what's to do, and that's what we do, is we step in and say, I'm going to help now, but I'm going to make sure that help is what that individual is looking for. I'm never going to take over someone's life like I have a right to do it. The magistrates of the world that literally try to lock up homeless people are the violent men and women of our nation. We must really understand that mental health is not something that God is not a part of. That mental health is an opportunity for people around them to show compassion, to help them work through, but literally it has to be up to that individual within reason what they're going to allow and not allow in their life. In the Lord God's name, I put this report together, and most people will go, oh gosh, you just ruined it all. No. I couldn't do what I do. I couldn't be what, who I am. I couldn't become who I was supposed to become without the help of a loving God. And the truth is the organizations, the organizations that help homeless the most are those that come from a faith of helping the homeless. This has been Blake Ensign reporting live in Homeless Land, asking you to consider how would you handle homelessness in your life.